So we're now going to take a look at how you could program the concurrency mechanisms we've talked about using a couple of Java concurrent collections, namely concurrent hash map and blocking queue. So let's first talk about concurrent hash map. Very, very important concurrent collection, but probably by far the most common concurrent collection that's used. What it does is it provides an efficient set of concurrent operations on key value pairs, because that's what a hash map or a map's all about, using both object-oriented and functional programming APIs. And this really got its um, start, I, I guess, in earnest in, in Java 8, although there were some features that were added earlier as well. So one of the things that you can do with a concurrent hash map is have highly optimized associative arrays, which don't contain duplicate keys. So if you have, um, if you have one key, then if you try to reassign it, you'll just update the value. The key will never change. Uh, and so another way of saying this is that each key maps to at most one value, which is often known as an associative array. Internally, a concurrent hash map, like other hash maps, is implemented using a hash table. I'm assuming you're probably familiar with what a hash table is from a data structures course you've taken, but a hash table basically takes keys, could be strings, could be large integers, and it performs some computation on them, which is called a hash function. And that maps the key into a fixed size table, which might have, let's say, just for kicks, uh, you know, 256 elements or 1,024 elements or something, some fixed size. And if you have the same key that will hash to the same location in the, in the array, then we resolve that by having a, a linked list or some other data structure to do collision resolution. And as you can see here, this simple example just uses a linked list, but there's other ways to do it as well. You can use the concurrent hash map to insert and retrieve data elements according to their key. So here you can see that we've created a concurrent hash map, and then we have thread T1, which is putting key one into the map with a value 42. And we have thread T2, which is looking up the value of key, key one, and then getting back the value, which darn well, darn well better be 42 in this case. Otherwise, we have a serious problem. Uh, and as you can see here, this is basically the, the concept of happens before relationships. So putting the, the value of key one in thread T1 must happen before you can get the value from key, key one in thread T2. And we already talked about that in our earlier discussion about the happens before relationship. Now, if you have two items that are hashed to the same location, they're just initially chained together in a linked list that comes off of that element in the underlying array that's used to implement the hash table. So if we put another key in, it just happens to hash to the same location that gets resolved by adding a new element. Now, an interesting optimization that was added in Java 8 and beyond was that if you have lots of values, sorry, lots of keys that are all hashing to the same location, then the underlying implementation will replace the use of a linked list with a tree when that occurs. So if the number of elements in a bucket, which is what you give to the name of that linked list that comes off of a particular element in the array for the hash table, if that reaches a certain threshold, then it goes ahead and changes it to use a, a tree instead, or a binary tree. And the reason for doing that is that that way you can end up continuing to get very good performance in that case. And you can read more about this if you take a look at the link at the bottom of the slide, why they did this and how it works. One of the great things about concurrent hash maps is they're heavily optimized for multi-core processors. And that was the whole reason why a lot of this stuff was added to make it work effectively. So one thing it does, it, it uses a group of locks, each guarding separate entries in the hash table. And this has changed a little bit over time, but in the latest versions of concurrent hash map, they basically use compare and swap operations that are going to work on the element that's in the beginning of each of the entries in the bucket list or the bucket tree, if you will, uh, in the hash table. And the reason that they do this is to help to minimize contention. There's other examples of this you may have seen in, in practice if you ever go to a, a concert or some kind of outdoor event like a fair uh, or uh, some other thing that you might have. There's lots of people outside like a, like a sporting event then one typical way we do this is we have a whole bunch of portable toilets and then people line up behind them. So we kind of spread out the people 
and we have less contention for the shared resource, which of course is the, the restroom. The way that this works internally is also carefully designed to allow read and write operations to require very, very little common locking and contention. So for example, if you do read operations, those are entirely concurrent since the way the cells in the list or the tree are implemented is to be immutable, except for the data field. So once the lists are kind of chained together, then there's no need to acquire locks because they never change after they're created, just the data field changes. So reads can go in parallel. If you have reads and writes that happen to occur in different portions of the underlying hash table array, they will also not compete because there's no common lock that's shared. Each of those different elements is worked on and synchronized by its own compare and swap or operation on its own distinct element. And if you have reason writes to the same list, they're optimized to try to avoid locking as much as possible. Um, so you can atomically add an element to a head of a list very quickly, and you can remove something from the list atomically by just setting its data field to null, and then later rearranging the contents of the list to get rid of things that were set to null. Something else you can do with a concurrent hash map that differs from a classic hash map, a non-concurrent hash map, even a synchronized map for that matter, is you can modify it while it's being iterated over without having to worry about getting a concurrent modification exception. And the reason why this works is that the entire map is never locked. So the concurrent hash map is never locked even when you're iterating over it. Everything will be done very concurrently. So concurrent modification exception is never thrown, you change things. However, because of the way in which the, the fact that there's no single lock that's used for everything, changes may not be propagated immediately. So you just have to be aware that it gives you a bit of weak uh, ordering guarantees, which is usually perfectly fine. In contrast, a synchronized map only uses one lock. So the minute you only have one of something in a concurrent program, that can often become a source of contention and a bottleneck to performance. You've probably seen examples of this too in real life. If you've ever gone to a, to a concert, for example, and there's only one restroom uh, or one door into a restroom, then you have this gigantic queue of people queuing up behind it. And that's because there's sort of only one way to get in. Uh, and that is not as efficient as spreading things out the way that we showed you earlier by using the concurrent hash map approach, which doesn't have a single lock for the entire data structure. So as a consequence of all this, concurrent hash maps are much more scalable than synchronized maps. And in fact, if you were to go back and take a look at that EX9 example in my Java 8 folder in my live lessons repository on GitHub, and you were to run it, you would see how concurrent hash map is much more efficient than synchronized hash map. So just taking a look here, if you look at the results, you'll see that the concurrent hash map took much less time to run to figure out whether n numbers are prime than synchronized hash map. And that's because synchronized hash map had only a single lock, whereas concurrent hash map doesn't. And the cool part about the way the test is written is that all you have to do is just magically change the map that's passed into the run test benchmarking method. And it will then keep everything else the same, but you'll have a different synchronizer that's used under the hood in order to guard access to the underlying map. Another nice thing you get with concurrent hash map is a whole slew of atomic get and maybe set methods, which are used to optimize the behavior. So here's one example we've looked at before. This is compute if absent, which says if the key isn't already associated with a value, compute its value and use the given function, or sorry, compute the value using the given function and then enter that value into the map and return it. So compute if absent is basically a super optimized way of doing uh, what I show you down below where we would uh, atomically with like a synchronizer, which I've left out, but just think about this conceptually, get the current key, see if its value is null. If it is, apply this function. If the value you get back is not null, put the element into the map and then return the value. So this is kind of the old school way of doing things, whereas concurrent compute if absent does it very efficiently. There's also a put if absent method, which will associate 
a value with a key if it's not already there. So if it is there, it's ignored, but if it is absent, it's put. And again, it's super optimized. So rather than calling get and seeing if the value is null and only putting it if it's null, um, it just does that all atomically. There's also replace, which is something that uh, we've been talking about in the context of our examples so far, uh, except when it's used with a concurrent hash map, this has a special meaning. So what it'll do is it'll replace the entry for a key only if currently mapped some value. And it does this atomically, of course. And then here's my favorite example, which you actually get a chance to use in the upcoming assignment 3B programming assignment, which is called replace that has three parameters. And this is basically the hash map equivalent of the compare and swap operation. So as you can see here, what replace does is it atomically checks to see if the item is currently in the map. And if the current value in the map equals the old value, and only if both those things are true, does it update the old value with a new value. So again, it's basically a hash-based version of compare and swap. And this will turn out to be very useful for certain use cases that are important for upcoming programming assignments. The last thing I want to talk about very briefly here is blocking queue. So a blocking queue is just a queue that has certain properties. One property is if you try to take something from an empty queue, you have to wait. And if you try to put something in a full queue, you have to wait. So that's basically the semantic of, of a blocking queue. And, and we've looked at this implementation earlier in the context of array blocking queue, but there's a couple of different blocking queue implementations. When you add to a full queue or you retrieve from an empty queue, You'll either end up blocking indefinitely, depending on which method you call, or you can time out after waiting a certain time, or you might return immediately, depending on the value of the timeout. So you can both block and or timeout. Many blocking queue implementations under the hood use Java Rantrant lock and condition objects, as we saw when we looked at the, the array blocking queue implementation in our earlier lessons on Java Rantrant lock and Java condition object. So that's the end of our discussion about concurrent hash map and blocking queue, which will put you in very good position to be able to do one of the upcoming programming assignments, which will be assignment 3B. And we'll start that one in a couple of weeks.